it's, it's good to care about that. So, I know you from uh, last time to tell you a little bit more about the least squares. So, what are the basic form of least squares is essentially uh, when you have uh, noisy data, uh, for example, uh, you suspect that uh, something should have uh, uh, linear dependence on the value of the inputs, right? And you make measurements. And uh, of course, what you get because of noise and the measurement error doesn't, the points won't belong in general to a straight line. But what you can ask, you can ask uh, what is the line so that the sum of the squares of the difference of what the line predicts, what the value should be and what your sample data tells you what your measurement is. So you want sum of the squares of uh, uh, these differences to be as small uh, as possible. A slight variant of this is when you don't look for sum of the squares of these differences, but sum of the squares of the distances to the line. This is sometimes called total um, least squares. Uh, but the most common form is uh, the one uh, with uh, uh, just the differences in coordinates, right? So if you want to fit um, a function f uh, that depends on some parameters, say alpha, uh, and x, uh, in general what you want to do is to minimize sum when i goes from 1 to n, if n is the number of sampling points. Uh, so this is sampling point s1, s2, up to sn, and then the difference uh, f alpha uh, at xi minus the sample value uh, si and then squared. So uh, minimize, uh, or I should say, choose uh, alpha which minimizes Uh, this um, uh, difference, so if this is sample point S1, this here, oops, sorry, I'm calling them S's and uh, the values. So let me put here uh, X1, X2, up to X, and, and here is the value S1, this is value S2, and here is value Sn. And if this is a line, a line is parameterized by just two parameters, right? A line L of x is of the form uh, Ax plus b. So in this case, you would have only two unknowns. So this vector alpha, in this case, would be just uh, uh, Ab, right? So you would this would have only two, so these are numbers, right? These are the x coordinates, and these are the sample values uh, at these coordinates, right? So in this case, you would have only two variables, and of course, this is minimized by finding the partial derivatives uh, for, so if the, the null bit denotes this sum as s of alpha, then this is minimized by computing d s uh, of alpha over d alpha i 
right? And uh, setting them all equal to zero when I goes between one and the number of parameters, say, n, the length of vector x, right? Um, another, uh, you know, this has been independently introduced by several, probably many people, in fact, but uh, it appears that the earliest uh, introduction of this was by Gauss, uh, and uh, uh, he used it to predict the position, I believe, of an asteroid. Um, so you know that the orbit should be an ellipse, but you don't know the parameters of the orbit, but you have measurements, observation uh, of the planet position, and what you want to do is you want to put uh, an ellipse that fits the best uh, uh, the um, observed uh, data. I believe Legendre, but that Gauss didn't publish the method for many years, and uh, I think Legendre came up independently with this, and then the two big guys had an argument who came up with the invention. Okay, so um, let's see what this boils down in in general, you see, usually this function f is a, a taken to be a linear combination, right, because in order for these least squares to be solvable, f has to be sufficiently simple so that when you find these partial derivatives, you have a reasonable chance of solving them. So the most common situation is when your function f uh, of alpha is actually of the form, let's, uh, um, yeah, well, it's equal to alpha 1 f1 of x plus, plus alpha n uh, alpha n um, fn of x, where fi of x are arbitrary functions. So to speak, base uh, functions. Right? So what do we get in this case? In this case, uh, this sum S of alpha is then of the form sum of when the number, when samples range from the first to the last. And then here inside you have sum um, J goes from one to the number of uh, uh, functions that you have, and then fi of, uh, sorry, fj of xi um, sorry, alpha j times uh, uh, fj of xi minus the sample value at point i squared. So let's see what uh, ds of alpha over uh, d alpha k is. So, right. so you can go with the differentiation through this first sum, i equals from 1 to n. And then you have this quadratic form, so you will have this uh, square, actually. Uh, you have two times, right? And then here you will have some j equals from 1 to n, alpha j, fj 
of xi minus si. So that's the derivative of the square, and then you have to go inside to differentiate within with respect to alpha k. Everything will be zero except uh, when j is equal to your variable of differentiation, so you will have only uh, alpha k. Right? Sorry, not alpha k, only. I'm still asleep, sorry. Uh, only fk of uh, uh, <coughs> xi. Right? And uh, 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 we have to set this equal to 0. And k, of course, ranges between 1 and the number of variables, which is n. Of course, this 2 can go out, and uh, we can cancel it out, because it has to, this is equal to 0. <laughs> so what do you get? Uh, and you can move this to the other side of equation. So you get then sum i equals from 1 to n, um, and then here you have sum j equals 1 to n alpha j fj of xi, right, uh, is this uh, has to be equal to the sum when i equals from 1 uh, to n si um, fk of xi. I hope I didn't mess up anything. Let me look. Like Sorry? The 2. The 2 disappears because it can go outside. And this is equal to, so it multiplies both oh, these, yeah, yeah. right? So it goes away, yeah? So, um, I have a bad feeling that, some, that I'm messing up something. Of course I'm messing up. I'm, what am I messing up? It's FK. Of course. Yeah. Oh, So f k of x i is equal to that. Ah, now it's much better, right? So now, uh, and here, of course, we have k such equations. And now, let's move to the other board. So what is our favorite uh, method of uh, writing such systems of linear equations, right? Because this is a system <coughs> of linear equations in unknowns alpha, right? So here, um, uh, so alpha, uh, alpha j are the unknown parameters uh, of the best fit. Well, it's easy to see that this, if you write this in a matrix form, then it's, uh, if you introduce matrix A to be the following matrix, it's matrix uh, F1 of X1, F2, of x1 up to fn of x1, then f1 of x2, f2 of x2, fn of x2, 
and all the way up to uh, Fn, no, sorry, uh, F1 of uh, Xn, uh, F2 of Xn, F1 <coughs> of X capital N, right? So in this way is uh, Fi's and, uh, or uh, how did we call them, Fj's, and in this way is uh, uh, Xi's. So this is of what size? It's of size uh, n times small n. And now it's easy to see, right, with this uh, double summation, um, that this amount, that uh, this system is actually A transpose times A times vector alpha is uh, equal to A transpose uh, times vector S, where uh, S is just the vector of samples S1 up to S, Sn, right? Because if you transpose this, then you will have a uh, points this way, and that's precisely what you are summing over here, right? You have precisely uh, sample Si, right? The i sample here will be multiplied by um, f at, uh, uh, at Xi, and then uh, arranging the sum up over all functions. And similarly here, if you transpose matrix, then the samples will go this way. When you multiply with A, then the samples will go this way. So it's summation uh, over, uh, uh, first over all samples, and then multiplied by vector AI. And that's precisely what you get if you exchange the order of summation. If you put uh, this inside, then you will have some of the alpha j's, right? So um, of the sum over i of these products, right? So in uh, the position j, k, you have uh, some, uh, the product uh, of the j function and k function at point i. And that's precisely what you get if you transpose this. And so this way go samples, and this way go samples. So when you multiply, it will be summation first with respect to uh, samples, right? And then in the product, you multiply with the vector alpha, <coughs> right? <coughs> now. Um, if your functions are linearly independent, this will always result, uh, so this is a matrix of size n times n, right? And if the functions are linearly independent, uh, this product will be a non-singular matrix, and uh, you can invert it, and you get that alpha is equal uh, a transpose A inverse times A transpose times the samples, right? And this guy here is usually denoted as A plus, and it's called the pseudo inverse of matrix A. Yeah? <coughs> so, Of course, matrix A need not be invertible in the sense that uh, it's not even a square matrix, right, in general. Okay, now, in practice, though, 
you never invert a matrix because this is numerically a uh, very unstable procedure. Um, what you do in practice, you actually explicitly solve system of linear equations, uh, right, by, some, by a convenient uh, iterative, um, uh, iterative algorithm. So uh, in MATLAB, uh, uh, right, you wouldn't put, uh, um, uh, so in MATLAB, this would be AT over ATA, and then MATLAB doesn't try to invert the matrix, but ra runs an iterative procedure for uh, um, computing, for computing this matrix. Okay, now, Besides this, uh, that uh, you should not invert, uh, almost always you should not even do exactly this in the first place because the system obtained in this way is almost always ill-conditioned, which means that slight perturbation of the coefficients uh, make huge <laughs> differences in the values of alpha and uh, lots <coughs> of parameters might take very large values. So to do, uh, to kind of tame this problem, what you do is uh, you do regularization. Um, so instead of minimizing S alpha, right, so instead you minimize S hat alpha, that looks like this. It's exactly what we had before, so sum over all sampling points, then linear combination of your functions multiplied by the corresponding parameter alpha j. Minus the sample value, right? So this is what we had before. <coughs> but then you add a small factor mu times sum when uh, j goes from 1 to n of uh, alpha j squared. And usually mu uh, can be somewhere between 10 to the minus 14 even, which is almost close to uh, machine precision, right? But uh, usually smaller than 10 to the minus 3. Um, and in most of the cases, uh, depending very much of be the behavior of these functions fj, but in most of the cases, uh, um, the, the least squares tend to be reasonably robust for the choice of mu, right? So what is the idea here? You want to get with a function that is linear combination of your basis functions. You want to get as close as, po as close as possible to the sample values, but penalizing if the parameters that you use get too large. So you don't allow the parameters to explode, right? Because you see, <coughs> alphas can be, of course, both positive and negative. And so, so, so la, uh, alphas can get very large values, but that cancel out in a subtle way yeah, to keep this uh, close to SI. But usually this corresponds to uh, non-realistic kind of values for alphas that are uh, not uh, kind of not acceptable. And in fact, in the book, you can see a plot for the least squares for the recommender system, 
as you change <coughs> mu, uh, how close you, uh, you know, how good is uh, uh, your fit. Uh, so th this, this phenomenon when alphas kind of go out of, out of range, so to speak, is called overfitting, right? You are kind of finding artificial solution that gets excessively close to SI, probably closer than the level of noise that you have. Yes? Uh, so in a recommendation system, when alpha gets big, uh, it will probably get overfitting. But yeah. why, when alpha is small, it still can cancel out the movie bias and user bias, still can cancel out what about when it is small, why it's not resulting overfitting that when it's large? Oh, sorry, why is it that? Uh, why the bias, when it gets large, will result in overfitting, but not when it is small? It still well, can cancel okay. out when So it's you see, if, what, if you think about biases, uh, bias tells you you know that, for example, a user is giving you uh, uh, excessively large marks or excessively small marks. But in uh, the biases that you are interested in that correspond to reality uh, should be smaller than the range of the marks, right? So you want biases that uh, are smaller reasonably smaller than the range of the marks, right? Uh, and uh, uh, this term blocks them for going out of range, becoming, you know, it makes no sense that bias of a user is bigger <coughs> than the range of the, of the marks. So you choose mu judiciously. And again, how do you know that you did a good job? It's again the same thing uh, with uh, uh, your final recommender system, whether it does a good prediction. So you have to, this mu is kind of also learned in the process uh, of fitting the data. It's one of the parameters that uh, you search for, right? Okay, so um, what does this factor change here? Well, if I differentiate this, uh, I'll have exactly what I had before, plus two times mu times alpha k. Yeah? Two gets canceled uh, together with the two here. So it's just mu times alpha k, and this is easy to see that uh, alpha hat then is actually the following expression. It's uh, a transposed times a plus mu times identity matrix of size n times n, right? And, that, and this inverse, and then A transpose, and then sample vector. So you just add to the diagonal of AT times A, right? You only on the diagonal, you add a small quantity uh, mu, and this has really kind of miraculous effect on uh, uh, how uh, conditioned uh, this linear system is. It becomes um, really, really uh, robust. Uh, now, you see, um, I said that uh, um, that um, you should not invert the matrix. But you see here, the matrix is uh, the first, uh, the matrix that has to be inverted, right? Does not depend on samples at all. It depends only of the values of the basis functions. So it's dep independent on the samples. Uh, so, this part, right, is independent on the sample. Samples appear only here. So what I told you, I actually lied. You see, you can, uh, rather than using iterative procedure here, you simply set Mathematica to a precision of, say, 100 digits. And you literally <coughs> invert this, uh, you invert this matrix, and everything becomes really uh, robust, 
uh, so uh, it, and you get just a kind of uh, a single matrix when you multiply with a transpose right so usually this can be pre-computed right and stored for different values of the samples that you are fitting providing there at the same sampling instance right so this is uh, in fact I have to admit uh, rather than finding a Clever, cleverer way of doing things. I have run uh, some computations on Mathematica with uh, uh, 10,000 digit precision to avoid numerical instability. And you know what? Mathematica really crunches it. Really, you know, you compute such things, for example, only once. Um, in fact, a procedure for producing orthogonal polynomials for an empirical weight, uh, you can just uh, set Mathematica uh, to a few tens or a hundred of thousands of digits and it's really, all numerical instabilities disappear, right? So this is the lazy way of, uh, of doing numerical analysis, but uh, if it takes less time to code and you don't like coding, there you go. Okay, so this is the story of least squares. Uh, so please read it in the textbook uh, because, uh, you know, it's, it's just fitting curves. Uh, what is the most common, uh, uh, one of the most common examples? So, for example, you, you have certain data, right, and you suspect uh, that uh, this should be governed by a low degree polynomial, right? Well, then you simply say, okay, let my polynomial say a uh, quadratic polynomial is just a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared. So here, uh, f0 is just 1, f1 is just x, and f2 uh, is just, uh, uh, I guess I should write variables, and f2 of x is just x squared, so your unknowns uh, will be a0, a1, a2, and lo and behold you make this expression to kind of smooth data, right? But one has to be really careful Polynomials are not very uh, good uh, for such purposes. Usually one uses something called splines, which are piecewise polynomials that are sufficiently smooth on the junction uh, points when you trans transit from one polynomial to another. Uh, but you might want to generate some data in Python, right, uh, and try a few fits. Uh, uh, try to, you might want to try to do it without regularization and with the regularization and see uh, what you get. So it's for this curve fitting, right? Um, uh, least squares are indispensable and uh, uh, very important. Okay, so this is the, was the missing part about the neighborhood recommender system. So now we are going to look at another type of recommender system that is based on something called positive matrix decomposition or latent variables. Recommender system. Okay. What is the idea? So remember, in a recommender system, you have a la very large matrix. Uh, for example, in um, in next week, next, next, uh, net Netflix challenge, this was of size about half a million, right? 
uh, if I remember it correctly. And this one was about, I think, 18,000. And that is only partially filled, right? Not everyone has seen all the 18,000 movies, hopefully. And now from this, you want to uh, see how, what, you should, what you should recommend to this person. Namely, you want to fill the blanks and then pick the largest score as the most likely that this person will like the movie. So now the logic, the inspiration for the method is actually quite intuitive. You see, one can argue that whether you like a movie or not is reducible to relatively few parameters. Uh, for example, um, you might what are the features of a movie? Well, for example, it would be uh, the genre, right? And usually not all the movies uh, are in a single genre, so to speak, but they kind of have different components, right? So a movie uh, can have the following. First, for example, is there action in the movie? Is it some, right, so action? Now, even in action movies, it's not just action movie, you usually have some corny romantic story also in the background. So, roman uh, <coughs> romance, right? Then, uh, for example, movies, some people like special effects. Uh, then, uh, whether movie is long or short. Uh, some people like long movies because when they pay a lot of money to get a ticket, they want uh, the value for this, right? And you can imagine, uh, maybe it is quite plausible that uh, there should be, say, uh, 300 items. Uh, so that every movie can be reasonably described in the sense that is there an action component? Yes, for example, this is uh, what's, uh, uh, like, let's say, Avatar, right? Action component, yeah, there is lots of action, so, but it's not only action, so say, uh, how much of action is point 0.9? Is there a romance? Well, yeah, right, there is romance between uh, this uh, funny green, what they did. <laughs> 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 <laughs>